Any Capcom fans in the house? My name is uh, Francis Bauer, one of the best for Capcom. It's my pleasure to present you this very informative and interesting panel. We like doing these. We have those others where it's very marketing and we're showing you buy this, buy this, buy this. But what's going to go happen here is we're going to bring you all the creators of the game. And you'll find out in depth every step of the way from animation to concept to music. And then we'll ask you to buy it. <laughs> but uh, after you check out this awesome panel, be sure to please come down to the Capcom booth, 215, right in A Hall, and uh, play the game, jump in Scoot McDuck's money bin, and get a DuckTales pin, and all of that other good stuff. Ready? So, without further ado, woohoo, let's go! <laughs> So before we get into that, I mean, of course, this is going to be, uh, we have to do a single on, we do it every time we do a panel. But uh, this is really going to be probably the last group one we ever do before the game comes out, so I don't know if we're ever going to do this again. So, this being the last day, I know it's early in the morning, I would like everybody to stand up. Well, I'm going to stand up. Wow. I'm going to this. I need to be very emphatic, you hear some really loud and, uh, yeah, and this is the last one we're going to do. We're all going to sing along, right? And we're going to wake up all the other panels. Sorry. Oops. Oh. Oh. All right. We all know the words. Do we hit the lights?
kind of a ground up design studio. In other words, we like to figure out what makes the game work and we like to apply visuals to that after the fact instead of um, the other way around, which is the way a lot of uh, other places do it. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, also, we really have high, um, high, I put a lot of emphasis on audio. We think that audio is a third of the experience. I really do believe that. Um, so, that's why we have you know, all these, all these uh, special yeah. represented yeah. the game here. So, um, yeah, why don't, we, why don't we move on to the next one? Oh, that was, that was our, our new building in Valencia, you saw the Photoshop balloons. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we do a lot of licensed games. Um, when, we, when we take on a licensed game, we really get into it. We want to um, really make the most of every opportunity. We really do love our licensed games. Um, and, and there's, you know, a lot of times we figure out oh, what's the potential of the opportunity here, and often we try to do more with it than it is expected. That was definitely the case with DuckTales. Um, some of the titles you can see here um, that have worked out before, you might have played some of them. I don't think we're trying to drag any out there, but that was last year. We've got um, The Boy in His Blunt. Uh, we've got Parker Four up there, we've got uh, Batman Brave of the Bold, we did a couple years ago um, uh, with Silent Hill from last year. Uh, just a ton of titles. I think we've, uh, we, we lost count. Somewhere, we're somewhere around 200 some odd titles at this point. And then we're also doing our own stuff too, which we'll go to the next one. So we publish our own games, um, the Mighty series. We have, uh, we're doing more digital download now that we can kind of do our own thing. Um, but we haven't stopped with uh, licensed games by any means. Um, and then recently released um, Shantae, a virtual console that came out a couple of days ago. Yeah, you did a great job. I think you guys did a great job of just basically making uh, the 
game itself that we'd like to show Yep, so then, then um, other things we did is, uh, you know, to uh, uh, weave the story into I guess we're trying to figure out a good way to explain the uh, kind of how we went about killing I, I guess what we, we, we kind of figured that the original team had a bunch of um, reference. I mean, you've got stuff like <clears throat> Scrooge in the, in the red jacket, on the set of the blue jacket, you've got the Terry Fermis and, and things like that. So, uh, and we pulled just a combination of everything to try to um, make it, you know, kind of make it our own and, and, and do it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything? Yeah, I'm listen to you. Okay. Um, let's see. So, <laughs> yeah, so taking, taking this, this Scrooge design, I mean, this is like a classic sprite. I mean, it's, it's one of the coolest sprites ever. Um, so it's already a great design. We want to figure out how we're going to make this in, in, um, in 2D and in, in, in HD. So uh, we have yeah, the same shape and feel. Um, what, what we didn't want to do is just exactly trace over it. You notice know, it's not a one-to-one -one trace over. We've seen that done several times. And results are kind of all over the place. Um, with this one, we want to go, all right, <clears throat> so this is like a functional sprite. First and foremost, so we want to be very faithful, you know, to, to what was there before with the intent of the original developers had, and then just try to <clears throat> embellish on it and make it extremely readable. Um, it, you know, we did change it to the blue, you know, back to the blue jacket because it seemed like that's what everybody would want to see. But we also uh, worked from the collision box, so it would need to be functionally, um, which is a you know square character with a nice center line, so you know where you're going to land. You know, his cane is like that. I actually think that was originally the Mega Man, his foot is kind of like that too. You know, when there's tons of platforming when you're airborne, you can like, all right, I'm up here, where's the center line and where do I have? Yeah, so that shape is really key to make the platforming very precise. Yeah, you should carry that over. Yeah, it's a very, you know, it's a very grid-based game. Everything, everything you do in that game when you're moving around, it's like, I think maybe there's a treasure here, maybe this is a breakaway block, or maybe I can use this to do that. You know, everything that was, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> everything that was established here with, with Scrooge, um, this really set kind of the foundation for how we're going to treat the entire rest of the game. So once we had this established, um, we moved on into uh, full, full into production. Um, so uh, if you want to explain that, this is the director of the game last time. Oh, that's that's no, no, no. Or you, you, want, you want to talk about the, oh, wait, 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 sorry, I just went, wait, wait, you kind of talk about it. I guess I did talk about it a little bit. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you guys don't know, Carl Marx is the guy who uh, actually created Scrooge um, and a lot of the other characters, like um, uh, Magic of the Spell. And you know, his influence is all of the TV show he wrote, I, I think all of, all of the episodes from season one, I remember it. I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, he created the Beagle Boys. We have more Beagle Boys in this game than we were in the original game. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, so we, we actually did have a, a, a Carl Marx. Carl Barks style Scrooge that we played around with at the beginning to see like well, how much how much Carl Barks and how much um, how much TV Scrooge are we gonna have? Because it, it, I, I touched on it probably repeated myself a couple of times, but uh, apologies, but we really do have a combination of Carl Barks Scrooge and then Disney Scrooge and then actually original Capcom team Scrooge. All three of those things have to be mixed together. That's exactly what we did here. So if you notice the uh, Scrooge on the left in the show, you know, he's like three heads tall. Um, the Capcom one is like two, uh, I guess, like Mario blocks tall, right? Mm -hmm. And so our new one needed to, to speak that same language, and that's why we landed on this design. So, uh, and now it's actually time to go to, to Austin, right? Hi, uh, I'm Austin. I'm the director on uh, DuckTales. Um, <laughs> um, so just uh, uh, leading off uh, where we're at, where Matt left off. Uh, so here's an example of many, uh, where, you know, taking Scrooge a little easier is a lot more reference to work off of. Um, but with, you know, the, uh, what we call the hockey duck in the Himalayas level, which you can go play now downstairs. Um, our, uh, our team, the animators, uh, did some designs uh, right off the bat, and, you know, the, the one on the left you can see looks very, very close to the original, and then uh, they wanted to play with it more, so, uh, you know, they took the inspiration from the Mighty Ducks uh, uh, hockey mask, which just, you know, makes perfect sense. <laughs> Here, you know, why not? And Disney loved it, so, uh, and you can also see we, we tried goalie pads on his legs, which, you know, aren't the original, but they just added so much more character to him, and, and uh, he's a lot of fun to see skating around in the game. Um, another character is the bee, uh, where, you know, the sprite doesn't look a lot like the actual bee itself, but um, our animators uh, 
Diego and Sasha, they, uh, one of them, I forget which one, basically said that, you know, Walt Disney used to draw this particular beat. Uh, you can see on the right, it was like a awards merit, and, and he would draw them and give them to his uh, either employees or, or something. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact story, but, um, you know, we had to pull from a lot of different places to try to, like, get animals in a show about animals to feel Disney. So, uh, it, that, was a, that was a fun challenge. Actually, if you can go back to the hockey guy really quick, yep. and can, can anyone kind of see where that hockey mask came from? It was very exciting. I'm sorry, I'm so boring. I, I know, I'm just <laughs> sorry. It's, it's early. Early. We appreciate y'all being here so early. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, onto the animation. Um, and so, one of the things that uh, was as important for, you know, matching the feel of the, of the sprite shape was the, the posing of the animations. Uh, you know, for Scrooge, for example, his, his walk, it, it took about three tries to get his walk to feel the, the same way as the original one. Um, you have to bear with me a PowerPoint, they don't play things all that great, <laughs> I have to click to loop. But, uh, you know, if we want to make sure, the, the original animation is just like three drawings, and you know, for hours we had, you know, uh, uh, quadruple that, I think. <laughs> So, you know, we, we want to make sure that the keys are, have the same, the same pose, the same feel, um, and, you know, stay very, very, very true to the NES game. That was, that was a big, uh, very important uh, aspect for us. Um, I'm muting that, you know. <laughs> it doesn't sound very good, but, uh, and one of the first things they tell you in animation is you need to act, act it out. If you don't know how to animate it, you act it out. And so I had to go act things out for the animators. We met every day, uh, you know, uh, for like an hour, and, and went over all the animations in the game because um, it, it just really helps you to get a feel for like you know what what you're gonna do, and so you have to put yourself out there and be embarrassed and show it to everybody. Uh, and <laughs> I don't usually have a cane. No, we actually got the cane for the. I, I want everybody here to go home and describe how to hold a cane to someone if you want them to hold it in different ways. It's like a, a bad game of uh, charades. Um, so we actually went and bought a cane because Scrooge holds his, you know, holds the cane in all sorts of different ways. I was actually noting when we did the cover that, you know, if you hold the cane one way, it can be a gun, and if you move your hand up, it can be a sword. Um, so just having a prop just helps uh, work, work your way through all that. Um, so here, here's a, an example of the, the very first step of animation. This is what we call rough animation. Um, the animator does it, you know, very loosely, just tries to get the timing, the, the general, general posture down, but it's, it's not perfect, it's not accurate. Um, and this came from just having a cane, just twirling it like that, felt really neat. And so we decided, hey, that'd make a great animation for uh, a long idol, which is uh, when the characters stand there for like five seconds or more and you're waiting for you to play. Um, the next step after that is what we call tie down, um, where you take that same rough animation, trace over it, get a nice clean line. Because um, then uh, what you're ready to do uh, after that is hand it off to be colored and uh, the final uh, line way to play. Um, so here you can see the final version of it um, in all its amazing glory. Uh, <laughs> and just here's some other animations uh, to show you. Like here's our uh, uh, idol. Uh, if my computer doesn't freeze. Now it'll go. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's got too much power. There's too much, too much awesome. Well, I, I think I think what's really important here is that uh, this is. Uh, we'll go on to this one. Wave forward style is basically animating exactly, you know, just the same techniques that were done in the old school shows. Yeah. So it's not like a fancy flash animation. They're really, really drawing cells over and over again and animating them. Yeah, everything is hand drawn, and on the left you can see, you know, the animators when they first do it, they have to, you know, put a lot of motion on it to get the, the feel. But once we get it in game, uh, the motion is all handled by the game. So that's why the colored screen is not animating or up and down as much as the, uh, the one on the left. Um, and then for character, this is a case log from After Minds for a character that is, doesn't have a skeleton. Um, uh, um, we used uh, a bunch of circles, you know, so he's really fun to, to see uh, in action. Um, so then uh, for the level art, you know, we were having a, a difficult time trying to match the DuckTales style uh, exactly. And uh, I went on the internet to search for, you know, what was the DuckTales look, and, and I came across the art of uh, Mike Peraza who uh, worked on the original DuckTales show. Uh, he was the art director for Little Mermaid. Uh, and I contacted him to see, hey, can we, you know, maybe get access to your DuckTales art? And he offered him himself to just uh, work, for, uh, work for us in the game. And so we hired him, uh, we contracted him to, to make our backgrounds, uh, to do our background layouts, which is the, the pencil style. So 
he made this for, for the game. So the, duck, the duckbird you see at the intro of the game, this is a uh, duckbird made especially for our version of DuckTales. So he, he drew this. Um, and so the first step is uh, pencil layout. So he, he would do this. And then uh, the next step after that, obviously, is going to color it. And the same way you would do with Disney you know, feature film or TV, uh, we had a background painter, and uh, Rick Evans um, is a veteran of Disney, worked at Disney TV for 10 years, and, and we hired him on, and, and, and uh, he did all this uh, amazing style matching of, of the original show. So this is his treatment of it. And what's really interesting is, you know, for people familiar with, you know, games, when you have parallax, uh, you need to have more uh, information there for all the different layers to go behind it. So we had, Rick had to kind of retrain himself to paint from uh, back to front rather than front to back. So if you look at the example way on the right, there are, you know, there's way more building there than you would normally see uh, because as the buildings move, uh, you want to make sure there's not a big uh, gaping hole uh, there. Um, and then this is a final game screenshot of, of, of the uh, intro section of, of, the, of the game. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. That, that's the title scroll of the, uh, the game. It seems to start. That scene transitions right at the beginning of the game, so it's not just a pretty little picture. It's, it's part of the game. So. And, and we approached uh, exteriors and interiors a little differently. For, for exteriors, we treated them the same way we would have on um, Boyd's Blob or Blood Rain, where you know, they're basically a flat plane uh, with the arch applied directly to them. Um, but for, for the interiors, we did it so a little bit different. We started the same process where, you know, here's uh, another cross drawing. Um, and then uh, here's Rick's treatment uh, on the painting of it, and it just it looks spectacular. It's just something that could go on the show. And so rather than just having a you know this piece of concept art that you know, maybe do something with our artists trying to interpret it, we actually use the textures from the, these paintings and apply them to our 3D models. Um, and so we, we match them very accurately, use the textures from you know, the actual painting process. And once we get in the game and get our lighting on it, um, you know, I, I, it, was, it was an approach we wanted to try because games in the past we've made it look a little flat and we wanted to experiment with giving it a little more depth a little bit, and we're really, really happy with uh, the way it turned out. Um, here's just another couple of drawings just for fun of it, uh, that, uh, between uh, Mike and Rick, uh, here's Street's office. And then uh, here's a shot of Himalayas, which you can see uh, if you go play the game. Um, and uh, so, just talking about level design briefly, uh, you know, for all the levels in the game, we started with the NES uh, layout uh, as our basis, and, and you know, because we wanted to make the game a little bit longer, have a little more fun with the things that are there. You know, some of these areas in the game they're very short, very little to do. So we blocked out, you know, keeping keeping all the things that are there, keeping them the same, keeping them in the same spot. You know, putting in some more areas. You can see uh, here are all the gray. The gray you know, the, the very left, it's, you know, the cinematic uh, entrance. But who, who here's played Transylvania downstairs on the show? Yeah, so you will recognize this. So <laughs> there's, uh, you know, the cinematic entry area, and then there's that big gray area to the right where you go outside and thought, well, let's go outside and face the ghost rather than walking in this, you know, up, upper level. Um, so, you know, it's just a small example, of just, you know, keeping all the areas that are in the original game in the same spot and, and having all their treasures up uh, there. Yeah, I think this is a really good way to be able to add areas where you can add and yep. more the story and also expand the how it was really cool in the NES version just add more of it. And, and, it's, and it's neat because there's a lot more hidden treasures too, so you'll be finding treasures you, and you've never have found before and then sometimes there are spots you think they might be. It's pretty it's pretty fun when our little designers, uh, who's here today, would, would, <laughs> would make it. Uh, I would come to his desk and play and be like, oh my gosh, like I think there might be a treasure there and I go and find it and I get so excited that there was a treasure there. Like it was it was, it was really great. So I, I love the exploration of uh, gameplay. Um, and then I'll pass it on to, to Jake, our audio guy. So, uh, yeah, I'm Jake. I did the, uh, the music and some of the sound design for this, uh, for this amazing game here. And uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to, to talk about the technical side of things because mostly what I do is I just sit down at my desk and I sort of black out for a while and I look up with a nosebleed and like, Done, so, <laughs> I don't, because I don't even know what to, to talk about specifically, but I will, I'll give you a reenactment of basically what happened when I started on the project. I come in, I'm like, Captain, it would uh, be imprudent for you to trust me with the, the monumental task of rearranging the moon theme. Should I fail, it would bring dishonor upon my Klingon heritage. <laughs> and then Austin's like, 
Mr. Wolf, I have full confidence in your ability to pull this off competently. And we started, I was like, and we started making out. And so basically what happened is, is I tried to do exactly what they did with the artwork, with the music, and just make it, make it like the original, but, but more. Um, one of my big pet peeves, I don't know if anybody here has actually followed any of my history with the game remixes and whatnot. If you're on OC Remix, yeah, who's heard of OC Remix? Yeah, right. All right, I was one of the first fools up in there, um, way back when. And, uh, and I, so I've had a pet peeve for like 15 years about when a, when a musician takes a piece of music from a classic game and makes it like, like, you know, a totally different thing and interpret it, it interprets it to the point that you can't even recognize the original, right? It's kind of, it's on my nerve. So, but I've been hearing this, the, the arrangements of this, of this game in my head since I was like seven. And so I knew exactly what to do from the start. Like, it was, it was, I didn't even have to think about it. It's like, okay, I've heard mine, it's gonna be like a background funk jam. It's gotta be. Like, Himalaya sounds this way in my head, and it has since I was a kid. So, it was very easy to get into the process of, of doing this, because I, I was a fan long before I was a professional. Um, and I think that, that honestly goes for most of these people over here. Um, we grew up with this stuff. So we've been thinking about what we would do if we got a chance to, like, make it new, um, since, we were, since we were kids. So the inspiration is pretty much, you know, it's, it's, it's spoken for. Um, I did try to incorporate some of the original sort of uh, chip tuny sort of sounds from the original. Uh, and it's no, you know, every song is pretty much note for note of recreation. It's not like, you know, I, I tried my best to, to avoid the impulse to make everything dubstep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did that in a couple parts. <laughs> you know, I had to have some fun. But uh, yeah, for the most part, um, I, think, I think a big thing that, that did change a lot was we, we used a lot of the iconic sound effects, like the, the pogo sound was in there. It's, you know, if you've ever seen uh, video previews, it's, you know a lot of the original sounds are there. Um, but this time around, I didn't have to do everything myself. I had a team of like super awesome dudes who were, uh, who were making um, sound effects for the whole thing. And so we, we gave it the, the whole AAA treatment. Um, you know, when Scrooge gets his plasma rifle, it's, it sounds you know, really broken and up to date. Um, you know, full, full fidelity right there. So, uh, really, honestly, I can, I can just say when, when you play the game, there's a sound test, so feel free to go in there and bruise and, uh, you know, enjoy, enjoy the tracks that, uh, that we put together. Yeah, and actually, you know, I, 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 yeah, I, get the, I have the fortunate uh, job of doing a lot of media interaction for this game. And a lot of people I've talked to in the media are like, oh, that's a really cool 8-bit soundtrack, but uh, I think that just speaks to Jake's style, so what he's able to do is take a fully you know, orchestrated sound to a set of tools and arrange them in a way that still sounds like intrinsically 8-bit, but it's not, so. Yeah, if, you, it's, you, if it's you, hear, you can hear, like, when you listen to the original, you can hear what they're going for. And so I have all these crazy modern studio tools at my disposal. I can make the quality there and sort of, like, Sort of pull off of the original thing. Yeah. Let me give you one little line of and then I'll go. I was at uh, at B3, and uh, and there was the DuckTales booth, and I just kind of walked by. I wasn't like hovering around there, and it was like creepy, um, <laughs> so more than usual. So um, so I, I go by and I'm like looking at it, and there's like a bunch of people playing. Four different groups of people, not just four different people in a group, but four totally separate, unrelated people came up like, oh man, DuckTales. Oh, that looks cool. Man, the music in that game was really good way back when. Man, I hope they didn't screw it up. <laughs> I'm like, they probably did. <laughs> don't, 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 don't get your hopes up. <laughs> but I did, I did, we did that movie like six times. That's more than I've ever read. Yeah, I, I feel bad that the pressure on Jake on that was pretty intense. I just have to apologize that we didn't have enough business space to fit into the game. So as you as you may or may not know, uh, I hope you guys know, um, Disney did a fantastic job of being able to bring every surviving cast member to the show.
to find actors to, to really, that really embody the, the voice of the spirit of these uh, guys and have them uh, basically voice the actors. Yeah, a lot of these names you might know already. Um, here we have, uh, fortunately, this is uh, Eric Bauza. As you can see, uh, he's been a veteran for years. And, uh, he's perfect voice a lot of uh, He's doing a fencing and gizmo deck, so I'm just going to go ahead and hand it off to Eric. And, you know, just, I know a lot of the folks here are kind of curious uh, mm -hmm. the whole process of starting with voice acting and, and how you get ready. And, uh, Hi guys, my name's Eric, I'm a voice actor. <laughs> uh, uh, you have to apologize if my voice craps out, I've been screaming all week, I'm sure you guys have too. Um, but by round of applause, who here remembers the gizmo deck catchphrase? One, two, three, bladder and bladder scout! I'm Gizmo Duck, 200 pounds of rough and stomp and bombs and destruction! Forward, ho! <laughs> when, I, when I got the, uh, the original audition for this in the old email, I like, like crap my pants, I swear. <laughs> Again, much like these guys, I grew up watching this show and it meant uh, a whole lot to me. And um, it is crazy that they did get like a lot of the original cast members, and it worked with actually definitely Frank Welker and June Foray. And, uh, yeah, they, they, they are still, still, still very strong, and uh, to know that you know I could be working and have my name even just cut and paste it into the same. Yeah. Walker's like, I don't think he's from this planet. But. <laughs> <laughs> and I fed June for a pecan pie for the 19th session. <laughs> oh, hello, Sweetie. Can you cut me some pie? <laughs> but, um, as, as, uh, as it goes, we get something like this in, in, uh, as a voice actor. I actually got the actual signs for it. And they incorporate uh, an actual MP3 sound clip of the original performance portrayed by Hamilton Camp, uh, who did Gizmo Duck's voice, unfortunately. Is no longer with us, but uh, uh, I just you, you just never know what you can or can't do until like you're put to the test. And I didn't know I could do that. Hamilton Kemp was a country singer, an old white man. I'm a little Filipino kid from Toronto, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> who, who would have guessed that I could have done something like that? Oh, very bizarre. But uh, yeah, and, and of course, before he becomes Gizmo Duck, he's Fenton, so he's a bit more. There's a, a bit of a character difference there. There's the more heroic type, and then he's more of the mild-mannered accountant for Scrooge McDuck, so... Benton's more like, uh, I want a job with status, recognition, a boss will remember my name, but most of all, I want a date with Kendra D. <laughs> I started out as a character layout artist in animation before I became a voiceover artist. So I look at all the hard work that these guys do and, and have done for this game, and I'm just, I want to give it up for them. Yeah, I've worked on a lot of like retro style projects with a lot of studios, and, and these guys really have been able to put more inherent love in the project than, than I. I it really shows that you know, you guys enjoy it. Yeah. So uh, as, as a voiceover artist, you see the art and you're like, gosh, if these guys are putting 100% in the music and everything that goes into it, like, I better... I better not drop the ball. <laughs> but yeah. All right, uh, uh, thanks, Eric. Um, so going on, we do have a, a little special treat for you guys. Uh, Jake has uh, got something for you guys. This is... Uh, it's yeah, not the exact exact version that's going to be. Yeah, this is not from the game, but this is well, technically. Kind no, of. no, no, no. It's a it's a version that I made specifically for Comic Con. So, but I left my Google Twin and my sustain bill at home, so it's going to be the way to me my laptop. <laughs> and please post this on YouTube. Right. Okay. Okay.
the, the, one, of the, one of the best, one of the magic moments was when when <laughs> God, there was a couple. He 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 was just cracking jokes. They're like like oh, you have three cubic acres of cash. He's like, I wish I had that much money. <laughs> just like you forget like oh yeah, that's just the guy playing Scrooge. But like uh, when when the guy in the booth forget his name was was just asking all this info and he's like, you're asking me too much stuff. He's like, what's your social security number? And Alan Young rattled it off. And he's like, yeah, I got it way back in 1930, whatever. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> when he came over, uh, over from overseas. But yeah, he, he was just, um, just just such a pleasure to work with. So, I mean, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Hey. My question's in two parts. I'll be really quick. Um, one, you Many of us who want to play this game have obviously seen the show and you know, played the game. Uh, what do you guys plan to do to attract a younger audience, someone who's never watched the show, or the only time they've ever seen the Nintendo Entertainment System is behind the glass case? <laughs> yeah, that, that's the part of it. That's more of a... Parent, yeah. parent, parents of kids love yeah. that yeah. so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your answer is, were you 
We're right there with you. <laughs> yeah. Play these remakes and they just suck. Oh, we, we sit there waiting for our chance to do it, and then we, we do it right. You know? You're going to get this opportunity to work on something like this. You better do it right. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, guys. You're welcome. Hi. Um, well, I'm not necessarily a musician, but you have like three generations of voice acting in your cast, I mean, some, some really big influences on me. Uh, and uh, might I ask who's uh, the voice director on this project? I think so, yeah. They, there's a, a studio in um, Burbank, Big Room Studios, and it's pretty much the house of like, Disney character voices, and they do like all sorts of cat, like, all the casting for like sound alikes and, and, and I know one of the one of the guys, Carlos Alves Rocky, he's, he was Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life. He also does like the sound like for Mike Wazowski and uh, the Disney character voices, they're so they know that these characters have so much history and a lot of, of fans surrounding them. So they make sure that whoever they get in the driver's seat is very, very well so true. Is that what I Yeah, I think Renee Johnson I think her name is. She also did uh, what was that? Epic Mickey too. So you know, she she's the, she's like the head of the Disney character voice or or not the head, but she's very up there. She's up there. She's, up there. she's very important. Yeah, yeah. And she was really awesome to work with, and and, she, and she, we just took a back seat. And she took the lead. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm right. artist for Jake. I, I love your music on the time. Sweet. Thank you know, best as music ever. My question was like you said that you were making the wages for the for the game. You what kind of inspiration did you draw from? So you, you made like the mining more jazzy type and, and stuff like that. Oh, know? on on uh, on that time. Did you draw inspiration from the cartoon? The game itself, or did you just go on your own? I basically, whenever I do a game remix, generally, especially if it's for like a, re a remake like this, I try to ask myself, what was the original Japanese composer thinking? What were they shooting for? Because they only had the limitations of, you know, the square rules and stuff. I do uh, NES music myself as a hobbyist. And so I know very, very clearly that you can't always get the exact genre that you want. Sometimes you need a guitar leak and you have to imitate that with, uh, you know, with a blip and a bleep. Um, and it can be very challenging to, to pull that off. And Capcom were some of the best at it. They, they, you know, the guitar leads, you can tell that's a guitar solo right there. Um, and so I, I tried to ask myself, you know, what were they shooting for genre-wise? What were they trying to make? And I think uh, for the Mind, for example, it was, it was to me clearly just a, a funk track, like a, a, a jam in my head. Um, and I've actually heard it exactly as you hear it in the video. It's been in my head like that for 15 years. So all I had to say was write it down. And that's, that's what I did. Inspired from the original game. Yeah, it's very, very much entirely inspired from the original game. However, we have cinematics. And they have an original orchestral soundtrack. Um, and I took that directly from the style of the show, which might I add was almost impossible. Because some of the, the original music from the show was brilliant. Unbelievably brilliant stuff. Like some of the best on TV ever. Uh, so, you know, no pressure. Right? <laughs> 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 talk about the CD being hopefully released commercially yeah. or constantly. Do we have time for the guy? We want so bad. We can't, we can't talk about that. Okay. I really wanted it. I'm um, sorry, it's not for the one guy like that. It's the last question. Oh, thanks so much for doing this, Matt. There was so much uh, care and detail put into this game, the artwork, the animation. Um, one thing I noticed when I was playing the game, you guys went through the, the trouble of getting all these new voice actors. One, one little thing I thought was almost a unnerving was there's no animation around uh, dialogue. And I was wondering, but it seemed completely intentional because everything else is spent now. Uh, yeah, to be completely honest, the voices was a bit of a late ad. Um, so Disney, Disney was like, hey, you know what would be awesome? We could really turn the dial up on this with your voice acting. We didn't have the resources to really pull it off. So <laughs> and, Disney, and they said, do you want to do that? It's like, yes. Yeah, yeah, Disney added it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, but it, unfortunately, uh, I'm mean, just with the time and the time and budget we had. It's, it's like a time and budget thing, and you just didn't have time. You didn't want to know, like a two frame, just like a we approached it like it was maybe a Super Nintendo RPG, where it's like, you know, that was, that was the idea, where the focus could be on listening to the voices, the characters doing an action that represents it, and just kind of focusing on like a 16-bit RPG style. Yeah, we were either going to have the budget to make it look awesome, or we're not going to do it well, so. And then they're like, hey, sound guys, your workload just quadrupled. <laughs> <laughs> 8,000 miles in our game. <laughs> <laughs>